Um, so welcome back to the second panel of today and the last panel of the conference, the ninth IBA conference in Pristina. And the title of this panel is actually the main title of the conference about biennials as tools for educational, cultural, and social development. Basically, um, we're looking at how a biennial can be a model for education and community transformation. May I invite Jordi Ferrero, um, education and mediator coordinator at Manifesta 14, to introduce the speakers and to start the conversation. Yeah, super. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this uh, final pan uh, panel of today. My name, like Marika said, is Jordi Ferreiro. I'm an artist and educator, and also the coordinator of education and mediation at Manifesta 14 Pristina. Uh, it was a really intense day and a half uh, with all the panelists, the keynote speakers, but it was absolutely pleasure to reflect upon education and mediation here in Pristina and looking also other latitudes and other, other spaces. So in this panel uh, today, as Marika said before, we are going to explore the question, how can uh, biennials and artistic organizations can work as a tool for educational, cultural and social development. Um, to contextualize a little uh, this subject, I also uh, like to explain that as an artist and as, educa and as an educator, uh, and interested in education and pedagogy, often uh, my colleagues in the art world, they always um, tell me like, this is a, a, a really boring topic, actually. And it's something that also Pablo Elguera reflected yesterday, right? When we are talking about education and mediation, usually we are uh, imagining children uh, doing doodles on the floor, which is absolutely the opposite, or this is what we will try to reflect today on this panel, right? That education and mediation is such an interesting political and pertinent topic, as we saw this uh, morning in the panel, um, that is uh, really interesting to put it uh, on, on value. Hmm? Um, and I think uh, from my perspective, if education is so important, is because if we zoom in our society and we try to try, trace on uh, our problematics, our concerns, we always will arrive to this problem, which is education. Um, it, education in some ways is where all the problems start. It's our, um, but it's a problem, but also I think it's a solution if we can work together and in, in, in to transform it like this. Um, uh, and, and as my colleague Rina Golsachi uh, explained yesterday, that is why in Manifesta we are strongly committed to our educational program and our connection with formal and non-formal spaces. Um, so for today, to reflect on all of that, we have three panelists with three different perspectives and three different organizations, but all of them work really hard on creating an impact through their different programs and activities related to art, culture, and education. So if you let me introduce really shortly, we have, first of all, my dear Ateka Malik from Karachi Biennale in Pakistan. Ateka is a freelance digital artist, a scholar, cultural operator, and co-founder of Karachi Biennale. Founded in 2016, Karachi Biennale is a project that connects art, the city, and its people, and acts like a temporary museum showcasing leading artists in Karachi, right? So, at my side, we have Sami Mustafa. Sami is an independent documentary director, tutor founder of Roma Versitas Kosovo. Uh, since 2017, Roma Versitas Kosovo has implemented different programs and projects for the inclusion of more than 1,000 students and youth from Roma, Ashkali, and Egyptian communities in Kosovo society. On top of that, he's also one of the artists selected for Manifesta 14 Pristina, and you had an event yesterday with Catherine in Center for Narrative Practice, so you had also an intense uh, week, right, full of events. And last but not least, we have Batra Abrashi, pedagogue and co-founding director of Autostrada Biennale Prisren Kosovo, so Autostrada aims to generate coexistence among communities by working and producing, producing together and addressing the need for non-formal education programs to empower the youth. 
Autostrada is also an important collaborator of Manifesta 14 Pristina, helping to co-produce the artworks of Petrit Halilai, Flaka Haliti, and Astrid Ismaili. Right? So what we will do right now is, uh, like the, in the previous panels, we will have 10, 15 minutes. I will be a little um, strict with time. And you can contextualize a little your projects and organizations, and then we can open the discussion for everybody. Is it OK? So Ateka, do you want to start? Can we start the slide presentation? Uh, it's great to be here in Kosovo. Thank you for having me here. I look forward to sharing my story. So yes, um, I'm going to try and answer some of the questions that uh, Jordi posed to us when he asked us to prepare for this panel. And one of the questions was, why is education important? So I've just put a statistic for you that in the last year, Pakistan spent 1.77% of its GDP on education. Most of our GDP goes on repaying debts to the IMF and for the army. And whatever's left, very little is spent on other things. But education is given a very, very low priority. So we basically have a number of generations of uh, people uh, with very, very b basic education. Literacy is counted as someone who can write their name. So even though they say it's 60% literacy. And uh, you know, one comment I want to make after seeing this morning's panel is that there's not really any good side or bad side. Uh, bullies are everywhere. And countries like ours, countries like Kosovo, we unfortunately fall into this category where we have bullies. And there are different ways to destroy a country than having a war on it. You can economically stifle it. And that's, that's what we have been going through. Uh, in Pakistan. I just got the news that our democratically elected prime minister who was removed by a no confidence vote in February because he went to Russia and he wanted to buy oil for 30% cheaper. Um, there was a memo from Washington which said this guy needs to go and he was removed by a no confidence vote and he was just got disqualified so he can because he was demanding a re-election. So we are in the middle of a civil unrest. We don't want to make it violent, but the whole country is behind him. So this is the kind of background for, for Pakistan, right? So now in this case, of course, education is not a huge priority. And uh, Karachi Biennale was founded in 2015 because our city, Karachi, has been going through a lot of violence. And um, the arms coming over from the Afghan war, and there's no restriction on so it is a lot it, of bloodshed and violence, even though we are not at war with anyone. Um, we wanted to do as artists, curators, something for the city, because it's a city of 22 million people. And uh, we decided to start this Biennale. And I'm happy to say that this October is our third edition. Um, just at the end of this week, we are having our third edition. And uh, education is one of our main, main, main uh, programs, the Educational Outreach Project. And you know, after hearing a lot of the talks um, the, yesterday also, our education program is fantastic. It goes on that model. So I'm not going to talk about the education program. Um, I mean, it has uh, stuff about, with UNESCO, we do intangible heritage videos with school children. And I'm going to talk about another project that is called the Global Outreach Program. And I'll explain why that is very important uh, to our Biennale. And that's the one that I'm heading. Um, by the way, the, sorry, I forgot to tell you the name of the artist for the last one. It was uh, Irfan Gul. And the, that uh, artwork was placed in the Karachi Zoo. And um, the mayor was also in that photograph. But anyway, it was a very, very well received uh, Biennale in 2019 on the environment. So. Um, what the Global Outreach Program does is um, we have a number of things going on. One of them is, as the name suggests, Global Outreach. So we send our management level uh, people 
two other biennales. We had a program in 2017 called the New North South, where we collaborated with five institutions in North England, Manchester Museum, Whitworth, Tetley, Liverpool Biennial, and um, we went to Liverpool. That's one picture of Liverpool, and then the other one is of the North England team in Karachi. So, you know, this is where we get to uh, see what's happening um, outside Pakistan. Because also, like Kosovo, Pakistanis don't get visas for anywhere. I have a Canadian passport, that's why I'm here. Otherwise, I, I would have to maybe apply for one month or travel somewhere else to get a visa. So most of our citizens are also kind of trapped, 220 million people. So what we dis want to do is bring people to our city. After 9-11, people stop visiting also. So this is a good opportunity, global outreach on a management level, go to other biennales, see what's happening there, share ideas. Um, that is one part of it. And uh, there are, there's, there's another aspect to it as well. Uh, what I do is I uh, like to get a pulse on what's interesting for children or young people in, in our society and try to bring in some experts. And we do a two or three day workshop outside the school curriculum because uh, this is a completely different topic what they're teaching in school. Art is only taught till grade three in government schools and that is also a very different thing. So. In, from 2015, we started working on STEAM, which is STEM, but with art included in it. And uh, we invited Wolfgang Spahn from Berlin and Stephen Kovats, uh, the, he's an architect. And we had these uh, workshops using open source technology for government schools. And uh, it was a testing ground for us because at that time, the STEM was not such a popular thing. Um, and uh, you can see here that on the left, he's made, he, the children made uh, handheld energy harvesters. So it's like uh, a handheld battery, but it's a torch. And th they decorated it in the bus, bus art style, truck art style, which is very common in Pakistan. The trucks are decorated with the mirrors and everything. So it was a very, very fun project for the kids, uh, especially when they all got to turn it and the lights came on. Um, because we have a lot of electricity issues, you know? So imagine having your own torch <laughs> and knowing how to build one. <laughs> Uh, the second one was uh, Wolfgang was teaching a group of DJs. He was teaching them how to make uh, their own synthesizers. So using uh, Arduinos and uh, again, it's skill related. It's and teaching you how to use open technology, right? Stuff that you don't have to buy uh, very expensive or pay license fees for. So this, wor this worked really well uh, for the two, three years until finally when we were deciding on the theme for 2019, for 2022, we said it has to be art and tech because that is what's going on. We have 60% of our population is between the ages of 18 and 25 years old. And everybody has a phone, everybody's using TikTok, everybody's using Facebook. So the theme for this year's Biennale is art and tech. And it's a very interesting show. Um, the other thing that, um, yeah, just he's, he's sharing all these diagrams, it's all open source. So teaching them about open source, you know, uh, that you don't have to have money to, be, to have access to this knowledge. Um, the second thing Stephen Kovacs came in with uh, Wolfgang, and we worked on a curriculum for STEAM workshops. For example, how to do these workshops in primary schools, how to do them in informal networks, how to do them at, uh, in professional organizations. So each has a different format. That is what we realized. You can't have the same curriculum for, for everyone. So we've released a paper. So it's this, these uh, meetings and these, resi uh, these residencies that they come for is a two-way exchange. Uh, and Stephen really appreciated the school networking system that we have in Orangi, which is a very low-income locality. But they have a school networking system where they train 300 schools, uh, private schools, how to you know, with their teachers and everything. So he thought this was a model that he could use and uh, propose in Uganda, where he works um, in South Sudan also uh, with this. Uh, and Ascotech is a technology which is like technology in a box. So there's a box full of open source tools. You can take it anywhere and uh, it can work anywhere, you know, with internet and everything. So very interesting stuff for us. That was the group who helped we worked with to create this curriculum. 
And now uh, um, STEAM is now very popular in all schools. The most, uh, the re the, then in 2019, we decided to work with wellness. And there's this Australian group called GEM. And uh, we had a lot of discussions about young people and the issues they are facing. Now, these are 18 to 25 year olds. And um, unfortunately, when you're in a very oppressive society and your politics is not working and there's no other way out and drugs are very, very easily accessible, um, it's a real slipping slope. So we called in GEM, the early morning, the morning session with GEM is a set of coaching tools, life skills, which teaches you how to get rid of false beliefs and all these other things which, which can be bringing people down. And in the afternoon, we do some creative expression and we, we used music and painting. And uh, the results were excellent. Um, it was a two-day workshop, but uh, these kids were connected uh, to further coaching from GEM. Uh, they had a few hours of coaching, plus they were connected on a WhatsApp group 24 hours for a whole year, plus they had access to a weekly session of videos which Jim uh, organized of different mentors who talked about their professions, could be a vet, it could be anyone. So they learned a lot about different professions and creative, um, it was an excellent successful program which we decided to continue. So, um, yeah, this is from another workshop, which is called Painting with Light, and that is the brainstorming session with the school curriculum. Um, in COVID, what we decided was that let's use this time for reflection. So there was a festival in Helsinki, I think Pixelac, and Andrew Griff Patterson, and me and Anjay from GEM, we thought what is the best kind of workshop that we can do for young people at this time. And we realized that uh, there is a big divide between our generation and the younger generation of creatives. So we uh, created a program which is a di for discussions between mentors and mentees on the topic of music, um, art, and uh, well-being, and also what after a festival, you know, Andrew's talking with one of his colleagues, just the burnout after a festival, how do you deal with that? And I think that was a very excellent uh, program to do in COVID as well. This year, again, we are doing the uh, wellness workshop. And uh, this time we are using improv. And uh, we partnered with a health research organization in Karachi called uh, IRD. And uh, they are bringing on a team which is going to do theater of the oppressed and uh, improv with that. So we bring things together, we experiment with them, see which, which works, and then we start uh, growing it as, you know, make, maybe making it more uh, structured. That's why the global outreach for me is very important. It gives us that space to experiment and especially target a younger population, which is... Um, hmm. So that is, uh, that is my um, presentation. You, well, I don't know if I can interject, yeah. but... Since I'm the moderator, I will change the rules. But I think it's a perfect <laughs> sorry, yeah. But I think it's a perfect example because in your pictures we see children or youngsters yeah. using technology as a tool. No, yeah. it's not just using arts and crafts. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, this is the way to get to the public. You know, how do you bring public into your Biennale? Most people don't even know how to pronounce Biennale, right? In Karachi, so hmm. so. But everybody knows TikTok, right? So exactly. So there's uh, that. That is that is the. These are the strategies we've been using, and they've been successful so far. And just to show you, for the younger kids, we have the certificates, which are very good for them, because uh, they like that. You know, that affirmation that I participated in a workshop and I got this. But for the older ones, we didn't need to give much. Look at this letter. I mean, it's it speaks for itself. You know. And they, they don't want to let go of the coaches. So we have to be very sensitive in how we handle the aftermath of the workshop. So, but anyway, that's all I had to present for, I uh, hope I've kept with Yeah, we time. will continue yeah. talking yeah, uh, yeah. during the, okay. the, but can I make you another question? Since yeah. I'm <laughs> because you told me in our previous discuss, discussion, you explained me that for Karachi Biennale, it's really important to um, 
address uh, these activities uh, from a non-formal uh, organization yeah. to a formal school, no? But yeah. it's important for you that it's non-formal. I don't know if you can explain a little about it. Yes, I uh, already explained because I said that uh, mm -hmm. this allows us to experiment. You know, we can't go into a school and say we're going to have improv. They will not, they will not understand. But if we say we are having a, if we, we do this workshop and we'll say it's about art and uh, creativity and it's part mm -hmm. of the Biennale, mm -hmm. they will allow their kids to participate or people will be interested. Mm -hmm. So we can experiment and see what works, what doesn't work. So luckily, we have that flexibility. There's not too much red tape. Um, and of course, we have our own rules and the organizations mm. we, we ask to send their children, they have their own rules. We respect those rules. So we respect the children and also the young people who come in. We ask them to sign if they don't want their information or photographs to be shared. So we are respectful mm. of that. But we have this flexibility so we can experiment mm. with a lot of things, you know? Okay. So then we can say that the schools are keen to participate with you uh, somehow. And After the third Biennale, they are, we have more people than we can um, accept. But, but the education program takes care of about 5,000 children. So That's a lot. With, who have school activities, preschool, and then they come for workshops during the Biennale as well. Hmm. So that is another level, you know. So good. Thank you, thank you. Okay, thank you. Sammy, do you want to go from here, maybe? Or? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I'll maybe go back a little bit, uh, back in time, right to uh, maybe give a little bit of a contest, a content of the um, of the ambition of um, you know wh where we are today with the, all, all the things that we do. Um, so basically, when when I was growing up, growing up, right? So um, there was this urge of me, uh, you know, finding out of you know why why me and you know the community I'm coming from, the Brahma community, uh, are actually different from the others, right? And you know why we have to like you know so we have the Brahma community and the Serbian community. So there was this kind of understanding, uh, you know, trying to understand. Um, uh, this this sort of aspect of it, and I was like, I don't know, 15 years old or something, um, and you know, I was trying to look for and 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 uh, for more information about that, right? And back then, Google didn't yet was um, um, available, right? So we didn't, we couldn't really just go and, and Google and say and see where the Roma come from, and you know, the only. Um, information that I have and the, the only knowledge that I had, you know, my dad telling us that, okay, we, we come from India and that explains why, why we attack so much. And just, you know, there it just gets even more confusing, like what the hell are we doing here? <laughs> um, so from that point on, I, I you know, um, I was, I was in, a, in a high school for medicine, uh, the medicine high school, and, you know, I was thinking like, what am I going to do, right? So, and how can I learn more um, uh, about uh, of, of who I am, right? And, and who, who we are as a, as a Rama community. Um, and, um, you know, and then so the war happens and we have all this international community coming in and, uh, you know, trying to kind of, you know, uh, construct the, 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 the communities back on its feet and, uh, and this is where I actually get into uh, the first workshop, film workshop that, um, that I'm that attending, right? And me and a group of friends who uh, who are actually attending this school, you know, the, the, this workshop, uh, you know, we're making a, a small film that is only like focusing, you know, right after the war, which is like in 2002, it's still very hard uh, uh, reality back then. Um, and uh, we are deciding to, you know, just not talk about the war, not talk about uh, anything that is, you know, pointing finger and uh, deciding to just show what is going on in the village, right? And this film actually made a huge success. Uh, it went, you know, it was shown in Pristina and it was, you know, the first time of, m of me coming to Pristina in that time and, um, and also international festivals as well. Um, 
And from that point on, I was like, okay, well, um, you know, I, I either go with a quiet life and, and you know, go to work at, at a hospital or whatever and, can, you know, go to six and come back uh, at four. Or, you know, I take the, the crazy path and, you know, make films. Um, and, you know, so I chose the crazy path. So, and... Um, and I, th I think I will never regret that one. And I think it was the best choice I ever did. Um, so I, yeah, I mean, then after that, right? So there was, you know, a learning after learning, uh, uh, you know, whether it was a hand-on hand experience from other people or whether it was, um, you know, me just, you know, making the films um, and having the films being shown out there, you know, participating in the festivals, you know, the, then, I actually understand is that they, you know there are film festivals in the world there you actually have the cinema that show only um, you know only show films that you know you select and stuff like this so like and, um, and I thought to myself well we have to do this in Kosovo and and we have to show it right we have to we have to bring uh, this you know knowledge to actually um, to other to, uh, to, uh, to to the people in Kosovo and um, and that, you know, and f for me it was, you know, making the films, but also showing the films, you know, it was about really to create this kind of content to get people closer to each other, right? To kind of, um, you know, especially in, in the Kosovo contest, uh, you know, 15, 15, 15 years ago, this was something that, um, you know, something really needed, right? Everything was, you know, all, this, uh, uh, all the communities were separated and, you know, there is no public transportation, so you can't really, you know, you can't really go from my village to Pristina if you, if you don't have somebody, somebody to bring you. Um, and so, you know, this is the idea of, um, of the first rolling, of the first uh, film festival that I, um, that I made, right? Um, and, but just to go a bit further, a little bit backwards to that one, uh, just before the festival, while making films, um, you know, and so the, festi the films were going to the festival, stuff like that. So I, I, dis I also decided, okay, so I have this knowledge now. Um, I know how to make films. They go to the festivals and, you know, even, you know, even went to the Cannes Festival uh, in, in that time. And, um, and it's not so bad, right? So, you know, I can, I, get, I have enough the confidence to actually do the same thing um, that I went through, which was to, to pass on the experience on filmmaking and, um, and teach other kids to, to, to do films. And, um, and this is where uh, also the first kind of film workshop that I'm organizing with the, with the youngsters in the town. And, you know, that like, uh, and this was like a huge kind of workshop, right? It was like almost six months uh, film workshop um, to really, you know, try to go through, you know, what is, uh, what is the storytelling and how do we actually tell a visual storytelling and, you know, um, and uh, understanding the technical part and how do you use the technical part to actually create something. Um, and it's also to, you know, um, to expressing voices of the young people of, of, uh, of the Roma community um, and, you know, trying to, to kind of feed and also support their creativity that actually comes, uh, you know, comes to the public or something like, uh, something like that. Um, but also to, um, you know, to create some sort of self-representation of, of what Roma are actually, because, you know, it's one thing that, you know, I will tell you what my community is, but then it's mass media tells it otherwise. And what we know about Roma, it's, um, I mean, us with as, a, as a collective, it's not the, um, it's not the reality most of the times, unfortunately. Um, and so, I mean, the idea of, you know, having this kind of workshop was, you know, I, I think it was one of the best ones I, I, I did. Um, um, you know, so it was also really to, you know, if, if you look at 
there are my filmmakers in the world, you know, I can, I can count them in my hands, and you know, this, this includes world non filmmakers as well. Um, it was also, you know, to kind of find these kind of people, you know, try, try to find the potential of who could be the filmmakers, who could, you know, um, change the world <laughs> with films and, and stuff like that. Um, and, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, the, you know, there's, at, the, at the beginning there, there was, a, you know, a, we used a different techniques, of course, on how to actually um, support these kind of youngsters, you know, from doing kind of high technical um, um, uh, instruments to make films from, you know, using mobile phones to make, to make films as well for, with, with the youngsters. Um, yeah. No, and I think it's really connected to, with uh, Ateca, right? Because at, at the end it's like trying to give opportunities to these youngsters that usually um, don't have these opportunities anymore, no? No. Yeah, I mean, then, so, so like, there was me doing the, fi the films myself, right? And then there is all, the, and there was the, the film workshops that I was, I was doing with the youngsters. And then, with the rolling festival, this changing, changing a little bit everything, right? Um, doing the first edition, I think, was, was the hardest one ever that uh, we could have uh, imagined. Because simply, the films that we are looking for to actually show are almost, you know, not accessible, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so because I had a few contacts with the festivals already and, you know, I could try to, to get in touch and stuff, so it kind of made it easier. But then, you know, how do we actually show films, um, you know, that will challenge people's uh, prejudices on, on the Roma, mm -hmm. right? And that we cannot only just show a film that is because it's a film, but it's really to... Um, to, to, to challenge this kind of uh, perception. Um, and the, and the, the other thing is that, you know, okay, so it's important that we show the films in, in, in Pristina, but, um, but it's also important to, sh to watch the films together with the community, right? So because there is no tra public tra transportation, no, nobody can come. So we had to uh, basically organize passes for people to come and, you know, create some sort of um, discussion that is more like a fruitful discussion, right? Um, then there were different pro programs developed as well within the festivals, as which like uh, the school program, you know, bringing high school students um, um, at the venue of the festival and have a special program just for them to actually watch and uh, discuss about the films and stuff like this. And this has worked really wonderfully um, for, for a long time. But the process to, to actually, you know, do it. It was, it was very painful way to go through it because <laughs> you had to go through the whole um, um, administration and authorization. Of and so it's so, so, um, um, then yeah. Then I mean there was lots of you know the different programs, different editions, and different um, things that we were doing, like a photo exhibition and paintings and supporting uh, other Roma artists through uh, yeah. Hmm. I guess I'm connected with uh, Pablo Olguera that we are talking all the time about this, giving these opportunities or how we can transform uh, communities or people, but as an artist, because in your case you are an artist, also you are an artist, so also you can reply. Um, uh, what did you learn from working with people? It, it transforms somehow your practice or? I always. Um, you know, there, there is one one question that I always, you know, uh, like trying to, you know, trying to figure out is, you know, how, you know, how is the, 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 the situation of, you know, we're making a film, for example, on Roma community, um, you know, the, the prejudices of others, of other communities that, you know, they have about Roma, um, they're visible, right? Because you see them on the screen, because it's, it's, it's there because, you know, the poverty is there and it's harsh. Um, and then, you know, you always think about how do you actually um, 
respect what is in there, uh, and how do you, um, you know, empower at the same time, mm -hmm. right? Um, both, you know, the, both of the community, the spectators and, and, and the people in the film. Um, and, and it's changing, you see. I mean, I, you know, I did the workshops in, in different countries in, uh, in Europe and uh, with the different ages as well. And this is all the time kind of changing on how do you actually practice and, you know, um, you know to tell what's, what storytelling is, right? And mm -hmm. how do you actually deliver um, this kind of in narrative from beginning to the end, right? Um, and this is changing a lot with, I don't know, with the you know, cultural background, with, mm -hmm. the, with the environmental background, uh, and, um, and with the experiences of the people, because this, um, this is what we are trying to do, right? We're trying to project experiences of people into the screen mm -hmm. to actually um, have an impact. Yeah. I think I don't know if you have something to add uh, to this idea about how working with people can transform your practice as an artist? My art um, changed and my art has become how to get all these things organized, like you're saying, bus. So now my art is about picking people up, connecting them together and making the whole thing work. Yeah, that's my art <laughs> Making now. excels. Exactly. This is the way that <laughs> <laughs> I will really reflect yes, that yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's why how my practice yeah. has changed. Yeah. So, Patra, uh, do you have something to add as a pedagogue? Are you an artist? I didn't ask you. But okay. I don't know if you want uh, to, um, to do the presentation. <laughs> Talking about artists. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, I'm so happy to be here. And I want to thank Manifesta and International Biennale Association for inviting me, and also to welcome all of you in Kosovo. Um, I don't stop, uh, I will not present all the projects, but you can see uh, in, in, the, in the projector. Uh, I will be more focused on Autostrada Biennale and how we created Autostrada Hangar. So, um, Autostrada Biennale um, started in Prizren, Kosovo, in two 2014, with its first biennial edition opening in 2017. It was built on the need for more cultural exchange in the region and with the world. It established itself as a connecting point, a route of the map of the Balkans and Europe. As the only contemporary art institution in prison, Autostrada Biennale functions on two speeds. One is the physical exhibition happening in the public space every two years since 2017. And the second is our new education, production, and exhibition space, Autostrada Hangar, in the former military base, now ITP prison. With the latter, we have extended the publicness of our platform by considering art production a sustainable form of learning and exchange that will address the needs of our communities. As we are talking today more about the education and its urgency for a long-term impact, I would love to share with you our story, how we started with the Biennale, and then how we came up to create an education and production space called Autostrada Hangar. Every edition, we collaborate with different creators from different countries, and through them we are connected to different realities in the world and keep on expanding our network. Autostrada's last edition in 2021, created by Erwin Durmusholo and Joanna Warsha, was spread in the three cities, with 20 venues in prison, Pristina and Peja, with, 30, uh, uh, with uh, 32 artists and around 60,000 visitors during the two months of the exhibition and public program. This way, we contributed in the development of cultural life and cultural tourism. Uh, in our third edition, previous edition, we had also a chance to collaborate in Pristina with two uh, artworks with Manifesta, uh, with Sunflower Field of Agnes Danas and Petri Talila's artwork. 
uh, we, how it started, I mean, <laughs> imagine we, we are doing a Biennale in the city that don't have gallery. So uh, we established a contemporary art Biennale uh, without having a gallery, without having a spaces for uh, art, uh, for, for uh, culture. So uh, we turned the old, old city into the open museum. Uh, as you can see from the slides behind me, most of the venues of Autostrada Biennale were not uh, abundant spaces, but the ones that already had their function. By using different spaces like bus station, the prison castle, and in the between the narrow streets of the prison, old houses and their gardens, uh, we, uh, we went to the people. So our approach is art to the people and not people to art. So we were not inviting people to come to the spaces as it is in, in most of the galleries, but we were going to the people. So we were approaching to the public and to the community. By then, I mean, uh, we were told that if there is a no gallery, then there is a no public or audience. Because you are doing a Biennale in a city that don't have gallery, so how you, are, how you, you come up with this, with this idea? You don't have even an audience for contemporary art. Uh, which made us really develop our approach that I was also mentioning, art to people. We were going to, to the different pl places. We were using, uh, and we were also opening cultural heritage buildings for the first time because prison is really rich on its cultural heritage, but the old buildings are closed for the public and they don't have a proper program, yearly program. So from the beginning, Autostrada Biennale has made the city and the citizens a very important part of organization, involving them regardless of their nationality, gender, religious, or cultural affiliation. Together with citizens, we have created new spaces of exhibition, non-formal education session, discussion, and reflection, stimulating in this way the freedom of expression, cultural exchange, critical thinking, and maintaining intercultural and inter ethnic tolerance with the aim of promoting democratic thinking. The last edition of uh, the Biennale was also moving around the logic of host and guest. So the artworks are not brought from outside, but instead shaped locally by addressing everyday traps and realized through joining inner and, out, inner and outer forces of artistic expertise, local knowledge and research. With our curators, we facilitated many exciting conversations and actions, bringing together prison activists, cultural workers, researchers, and the invited uh, international artists. Through the Tandem Biennale and this approach, we have connected local, regional, and European artists and create duos which were based on the collaborative and, con uh, and conversation project and later exchange between the same number of local and international artists. The Autostrada Biennale public programs serve to open learning spaces for young generation by following principle of inclusivity. inclusivity. This is making the program open to different communities who haven't felt themselves part of the discussion before. With the Biennale and yearly program of Autostrada Hangar, we desire to encourage various critical debates around artistic, social, environmental, and political concerns in our society. Each edition, uh, we had a lot of youngsters that we uh, engage in our team, and by then we were seeing that they had a great CVs, master degrees, but when it came to practical work, they lack a lot. That's why we as a team, we, we started to think about this seriously. And even without having a budget, we were also working in education programs that also can contribute to the youngsters. So then we started to, to work on skills building workshops programs. And then we applied to, to, to a grant and we got the grant from US Embassy and Prisoner Municipality to buy tools and machines. So we created, uh, we create, still we are not there, we are, we have here a great artwork of Plyaka Haliti in our hangar. So uh, last year we took the space, Autostrada hangar now in ex-military base, and then we, we through, through, education pre, uh, through education program, we, uh, we created uh, the, the whole space. 
So uh, the new created infrastructure with the different tools and machines, technology lab, exhibition space, green pavilion, library, bar, kitchen, co-working space, and other facilities will accomplish a need of community operating in the creative and cultural sector and beyond. Moreover, the space with its two studios, the industrial design studio and new media lab, along with its education program, uh, employing experts in the field will have a long-term impact on the young people for the future jobs relating to the art, technology, and innovation. More especially, there will be ongoing production skills workshops on design and fabrication, on wood, metal, and embroidery, communication and multimedia, robotic, coding, electronic, and 3D modeling. So in the first phase, we had 60 youngsters from all over Kosovo. And I'm so happy to tell to that 90% of them were women from different communities. And uh, the, uh, the unique aspect of this project is that everything that you are seeing in Autostrada Hangar, all indoors, were created inside. And we didn't took a company, didn't hire the company to, to construct the space, but we created with experts and with youngsters. So 50% uh, of all materials uh, were recyclable materials from exhibitions of Autostrada Biennale. So we saved the all artworks and then we recreated the whole the whole space. And as you see, everything is on wheels, so you can change the setup based on the needs. Uh, on the needs of the uh, community, our, our projects or our partners' projects. We have a library on wheels, for example, a shop is on wheels, a kitchen is on wheels, so it has different functions and you can, you can really um, change the setup in 15, five minutes <laughs> and also adapt the space based on the needs of the community. And now we just had an open call and we have uh, hundreds of youngsters that apply to be part of our programs. And we are happy that also we have uh, more than 1,000 um, green area in the front of uh, Autostrada Hangar so we can develop different um, environmental projects. And this is my presentation, <laughs> but also... <laughs> <laughs> go on, go on. Yeah, I mean, we have also a video, which is, um, it's not so long video, it's short, and it's very dynamic, because it was done uh, from our youngsters that were part of our education program. This was the space, how it was, I mean, in the beginning, when we took, and then you can see the whole transformation through education program. So now Autostrada is also producing. Nëse bazohemi në atës si është ideja për Autostrada Hangar, në fakt ka filluar shumë më herët se sa edhe vetë kriimi hapsires, përshkak që gjithmon ne si ekipi Autostrada Bienale mundohemi që të përgjigjemi nevojave të cilat komuniteti i ka. Dhe kështu jemi angazhuar që të punojmë intenzivisht në kriimin e programeve të edukimit, përshkak që kemi pa që të rinjet janë shumë entuziast, kanë shumë vullnet për pun dhe janë shumë të motivuar, mirë po kanë nevoj të përkrahen në aspektin praktik të punës. Për ne është shumë rëndësishme që të kriejmë ekipe, në mënyrë që të kriejmë edhe kultur të bashkëpunimit, të kultur të shkëmbimit të ideve, të dijes, dhe të kryojmë për voja treja të cilat në ashtu neve që të bashkjetojmë dhe të veprojmë duke kryuar dhe jo vetëm të konsumuar. Jemi jarë zakonisht e lumëtër dhe entuziast që kemi fillu programin për edukim dhe shkatsim të të rinjeve, sidomos në tre departamente të cilat neve që kemi fillu, që janë formësim dhe përpunimi drurit, metalit dhe qëndisjes, komunikim dhe multimedia, 3D modelim dhe robotik, bashkë me 3D printar. Kjo ka qenë për neve së unimi kryesor që të rinjeve të ju ofrojmë një hapsir e cila do t'i ketë të gjitha pajiset e nevojshme 
për me u shkatsu në departamente drejtimet cilat ata kanë interes për ju pëlqenjë, duke angazhuar ekspert të fushave të ndryshme. We uh, started with some online classes where I instructed the students concepts behind craftsmanship, uh, the use of some of the tools, I familiarized them with uh, many of the techniques and tools online, and then we came here into the shop to uh, work on some projects in regards to the meeting point we have for Autostrada Biennale. We're working on some tables and chairs and combination of things. Pjesa e cila është duke implementu për momentin janë pjesa e programimit zbashku me elektronikën ku jemi duke e kriju disa sisteme automatike për kontrolim të dritave mënyrë automatike, matja e lakështisë dhe temperaturës dhe paracitja rezultateve në një LCD screen dhe ujtja automatike e, e, e tokës në bas të vlerave që e marim nga senzorit. Pjesë e programit janë gjashtë dhe të ri të departamenteve të ndryshme, kështu që për e tyre më nëzon fakti që në 90% janë grafë, cilat kanë apliku në programet tona. Qëtash jemi në workshopin woodworking, që përshë një kena mësu dhe kena ushtru që ish me punu edhe ma nuvru me dru, dhe me thonë këtu e në disa për pajisjevi që naj kemi përdor, të fillu për sharës dorës, që është elementi ma i thjesht, edhe më ndete shara elektriki që është, dhe me thonë, një mjetë ma i përparu, edhe që na mundësën me bo ma shumë manovra me dru. Dhe me thonë këtu, jemi të mësu që shme bo prototipin që e kemi dizajnu, dhe me thonë që e cili ka edhe më ekspozu. Pasi edhe kam diplomu për modë edhe tekstil, zakonisht jam marë ma shumë me pjesën e tekstilit edhe me materialet, që fund me, me pas një ide sa ma të mirë për dizajnin që kena me realizu në fundë. Jemi fokusuar që të kryojmë programe të ndryshme të cilat edhe do të finalizohen me produkte konkrete, dhe produktet e para kanë qenë natyrisht vepra të artit bashkohor në edicionet të të reta Autostrada Binales, por edhe kryimi i komplet hapsires e hangar. Pra në vendësë të kontraktojmë kompanit të ndryshme për të blerë mobiljet dhe të kryuar kushtet e punës për Autostrada Hangar, ne gjatë programit të edukimit i kemi kryuar ato vetë ku 50% e tyre është bërë edhe me materialet të recikluara, ose të ripërdorushme. Pra ky fakt është një shembol konkret që të regon për kushtimin ton për mbrojtjen e medisit. Autostrada Hangar do të ketë funksionet të ndryshme në brenda objektit, dhe programe tona që do të zhvillohen do të jetë studio e hapër për artist, atelea, laborator i teknologjik, mirë po në anën tjetër do të jetë një pjesë e madhe e hapsirës një pjesë që ne po e quajmë hapsir multifunksionale. Do të shëndrohet në modelet të ndryshme, vartësisht prej nevojave të komunitetit, ajo do të përdoret naturisht për ekspozit të, të artit bashkohor, do të përdoret për koncertet, evenimentet të ndryshme, po ashtu për panelet dhe konferencat të ndryshme, të cilat do të kontribojnë në zhvillimin e programeve të ndryshme të edukimit, të shkëmbimit, të ideve dhe të kriimit të një bashkëpunimi më të gjërë ndër komunitetesh. Ne kemi vendosur që të zhvillojmë programe tona dhe të kriojmë një pavilion të gjelbërt, i cili do të ketë një program të edukimit dhe të kriimit të veprave të artit që kanë të bëjnë me trajtimin e mjedisit. Autostrada Hangar është shambull se si një hapsir duhet të kryohet në form që t'i përgjigjet komunitetit duke qenë kreativ, unik dhe përshtachme për nevoja që i ka. Ku me këtë ras, ne i falenderojmë të gjithë atat të cilët kanë kontribuar në realizimin e këti projekti madhor, i cili është shëndru në një mision për të gjithë ne dhe dëshmanë, faktin se si me motiv shumë të madhë, gudzim, vullnet dhe konsistens, gjërat mda mund të realizohen. So I think Thank we you. can start the discussion yeah. from Thank you. I point. hope you enjoyed and it wasn't too long. So. <laughs> no, no, it was okay. 
But uh, I was thinking uh, we can start the discussion by, uh, by this example that you give us, because even if your organizations are young or have less than 10 years, you can already measure the impact that uh, your programs had on, on communities or in youngsters, for example. Can you already measure it or, or to see if yeah, you can start it? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, if I want to be focused just to Autostrada Hangar, uh, we saw a great impact, really. I mm. mean, uh, the whole space and the whole programs were created based on the needs of the community. It was something that we saw we were facing in our everyday work. We saw that youngsters need the space, need the equipment, need the studio. And it wasn't so usual to have this kind of space, especially in creative uh, and cultural sector. That's why we, 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 we were developing the project and then we were like thinking, maybe this was something that we are thinking, but maybe uh, the situation is different outside. Let's mm. see and have this open call and see if youngsters really are uh, interested to take part in this kind of programs. And we saw that uh, hundreds of youngsters apply to be part of the program. And immediately we saw the impact because uh, we created the institution from scratch, from, from zero. So everything was created. And we wanted also mm -hmm. to not just to show them how to cut things, but also to make them really think, mm. um, to communicate, also to think outside the box, to give proposals, okay. but also to make them feel that this space is their space. So it's not that we designed and this is, this is how it is but it's your space and this sense of belonging, it was very important mm -hmm. through, through this space, so th through this project. So all departments were together in order to discuss, reflect, and to come with uh, different solutions. That's why we, we also um, have an, another open call and we will continue with skills building workshops mm -hmm. because uh, now also in Autostrada Biennale, we have youngsters that are employed because they were part of education programs, now they are, they are employed in Autostrada Biennale. So our institution is functioning every day, so we have youngsters that are also producing artworks, not just for Autostrada Biennale, but also for our, our partners in Kosovo in, and in the region. But, uh, I know that a couple of indicators that these programs have been successful is that uh, just a month ago I received a message on Facebook from one of the participants of our workshop and he's now moved to up north, he's, his village is up north and he's like, can you guys please come here and have a workshop? I'm, I'm a student of psychiatry and I, I think people here are telling me they want a workshop. So that for me that was fantastic because it mm -hmm. means it's something that stayed with them for, for ages. A lot of our uh, participants have also mm, become employed in this art field uh, as volunteers, attendants, or other things. And uh, uh, last time, the mayor as well, uh, and the government, we got uh, support from them by giving us mm -hmm. public places. Mm -hmm. Of course, it uh, turned into <laughs> a problem because later on there were art artist protests over there. <laughs> and the mayor was like, what are you doing? And we were like, well, um, we can't control it, it's the public. But you know, that those are indicators that the even the government, which is a very important stakeholder, realizes that these people are doing good for the community, whatever they're doing, you know, mm. and we can take credit if we if we kind of, you know, pat them on the head or whatever. So yes, uh, those are the kind of reactions we've been getting mm. and we want, and also the teachers, because it's very difficult in private schools to tell teachers that here's a new way of teaching science, you know? Mm -hmm. You don't have to open a textbook, you can do it this way. But we saw that in the workshops, the teachers are as much involved as the students. So these are the indicators, you know? They're non-statistic, but it can um, hmm. show something. I don't know, Sam, if you have any experience. Yeah, I'm I'm finding it hard to actually, you know, me measure this kind of um, impacts because, you know, once you have the ambition to, uh, you know, reach at, at some um, at, at some level, but you know, we are talking about um, very ex extreme cases, right? When it comes to racism, when it comes to discrimination, when it comes to to the poverty, it's very deep rooted. Um, 
um, it's within the community, but also you know with uh, with the whole with the whole the whole of the society. Um, and now you know measuring uh, you know last 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 edition of the festival, for example, we we had it during the you know during the COVID crisis, right? Um, and you know uh, we you know we had a few of the people coming in and then and and, and him giving the speeches and and I realized that you know the, the speeches you know the, you know like the prime minister was there and 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 and, and he was talking about it. It's the same from ten years ago. Oops. Right. We all we are still talking about the same thing. You know, it's the poverty. It's the, it's the and. Um, and you know, it's you know, it's 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 it, in in one way, it's very encouraging to go more for it and and you know um, and, and 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 work harder on the, to do that, to, that to, towards that one, um, and also you know rethinking of uh, what can be done, right? Um, yeah. But in terms of of uh, talking about youngsters, for sure, I I. I I'm sure you saw the whole process of yeah. these youngsters participating in your workshops, and I'm sure more than twice already, you know, like you saw how they grow as, a, as persons, but also yeah. as professionals, for sure. Exactly. No, I mean, for sure. I mean, then, you know, to, like, for example, I don't know, the workshops that we had in the first edition, or, you know, the, or maybe the, um, the first workshop that I w was doing, you know, today they are, you know, professional musicians, you know, the Jimmy Band. <laughs> Um, and um, and uh, and also, you know, in the film industry as well, uh, you know, there is lots of people who actually mo also moved out of Kosovo and now, you know, working in the film industry in Germany and stuff like that. Uh, and some are even, you know, uh, develop their career towards the radio and, and things like this in, in the storytelling. So this is, you know, um, this this is this kind of things that actually gives you. Hmm. Uh, the, the, the courage to go through, um, you know, what, what was I just saying before? Yeah, because and you, you know, just just a funny thing, you know, like one of the volunteers who um, who um, who was at the be at the very beginning of the festival. Like he was a volunteer, and he he was doing the Q and A's and da da da, and he was da, and you know, today he's the director of the festival. You see, cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I guess that, um, uh, at, at the end, the technology. Question. Ah, yeah, yes, of course. So l let me ask for a microphone for you, if some of my colleagues can. <laughs> Carl is coming, don't worry. Sorry, just because I know that you're going to be talking and not let me. Um, I have a question no, no, that please. actually goes around um, the, what you're talking about the impact before. I just want to understand, I think it extends to you too, Jordi, how, um, which kind of methodologies of evaluation that you have like in place already that somehow you do understand that helps you to see or foresee uh, a kind of uh, understanding different paths of projects uh, that can change the thing, but also that may qualify it, you think, through time. I would say so. I have another question for Tika later about mediation, but I'll, I'll do it first. I think this is evaluation. I think it's for me, it's very important. I may understand it might be for you. Thank you. This program that we did with uh, Jim, because it's also connected with, uh, she's, Anjay is connected with the University of Sydney. There was a survey at the beginning of the workshop, and there is a survey at the end of the workshop. So it, that's a good, way to kind of, you know, see uh, the difference um, in the mind state and also what more they would like to see. So that's one way. In the school-oriented workshops, we just go on the feedback of the teachers and the students to the coordinators. You know, it's not that much more survey-oriented. Um, depends, right? Um, it, it, it's like for the films that create, right? It's easy to see the impact on that one. Um, I, I don't know. I, I'll give you an example for a, for trap for um, for Never Back Home film that I made 
that was in production for, uh, I don't know, almost seven years, um, and that started the production um, in within the decision of the government that they will um, replace the, the ITPs, the internal displaced people after the war, uh, who were living in a miserable situation, and um, and this is where you know I, I start to to make a film about these people who were going to be displaced in the in the next few years, and it was a precondition for Kosovo to uh, to be independent, right? Um, and so I I was following these people. I never knew how long I'm going to follow them, right? And then in 2010, the film came out. Um, and as a, as a result, you know, they, the government doesn't really displace these people. You know, they, they had this um, United Nation, uh, UNHCR barracks, you know, living as a, um, a, as a contemporary uh, housing. And what, they, what the government does, you know, they, you know they, they take the people and put them in the same place and put them in a big building. Um, and so the whole film that talks about you know the process, how to get to that building, and but also what happens to the building, right? And it's also the location where it's built. That one, um, uh, that that building is you know it's the same. It's just next to the you know the the power plant. It's like really on the feet of the power plant. Um, and so the, you know the the impact on that one. You know then you know a couple of months after that. The film was made and that it was shown and that um, and that you know there was a uh, the whole discussion around around it as well. Um, then they decided to make the how do they call that you know the houses they next to each other right uh, that was then made in in Mitrovica. So I, yeah. Sorry, I also wanted to say, of course, we have our reports for our funders, right? Those are very good. Uh, resources to see the impact of the workshops. I forgot to add yeah. that. That's very important. It makes me think about the our schools program. That also is uh, what we develop is like to do a formulary for the students to give us direct feedback, even if it's anonymous or, or given the name. But it's a good indicator for us also. And I think it connects to another question that I think is really pertinent: that uh, we are on the good track and we are doing things that are pertinent for them. But also, I don't know if you have any methodology or any technique to be sure that we are not, when we are inside community programs, for example, or participatory pro uh, projects, to be sure that we are not instrumentalizing these people, you know, that we are doing programs that are absolutely horizontal or trying not to use them as an object, you know? I don't know if you have an experience related to that. You see, the, we follow the Biennale structure, and that is quite uh, good to stick to um, free, and uh, if there is a problem with accessibility, we will provide transport, we will provide food. Uh, so we take all those things into account because we know that the people we want to visit have those issues, right? So that is the main thing. And uh, of course, if someone is not comfortable speaking up or uh, in speaking in English, then we try to have a translator present. Um, other than that, the uh, NGOs or some of the community centers we work with, they have their own rules that, you know, children will come at this time, they will go at this time, and so we follow their rules. So more or less, we try to work with other organizations who have uh, rules in place. Um, if individuals sign up, we try to follow our Biennale guidelines. Uh, also, I mean, in our case, we are from the beginning, we are involving our target groups in all phases, in discussion, in co-producing, and everything that is done, it's responds to the needs of the community. Uh, all programs are free of charge, also workshops are free of charge. We have, uh, I mean, people from different profiles, uh, with special needs, from different communities, so, in this aspect, we are really taking care of being very inclusive project from the beginning, so it's... One, one last thing. There's one important thing that we do, which is very important, is having an exhibition at the end. I think that, for the participants, is very, very, very important because they can bring their families and everyone gets to see the result of their work. So, yeah, that is, we've realized how important that is to the process. 
Now that Gabriela opened the Q&A, uh, please, uh, if you have any question, raise, raise your hand. Doneta already have it. And the microphone. <laughs> uh, no, no. So thank you so much for your presentations. They were very inspiring. Um, and I think I found some commonalities in between all of the BNLs and the projects you presented. And it's always around inequalities, poverty, and um, many other issues that uh, surround our world today. And I was just wondering, and Jordi, you also mentioned that the education programs are actually not boring at all, but very political. And, and I just had a question for all the panelists. What kind of strategies do you employ um, to kind of tackle these issues? Is it explicit or implicit? Is it something that you just provide the space and do you do workshops or is it um, different kind of political positions that you may take um, in order to do this? Because I always find it difficult in working, especially with young people, um, how yeah, I was just wondering, could you elaborate a little bit further what would be some of the strategies to work with young people, especially in this regard, when most of the um, topics can be very difficult? Um, maybe. Um, so, like, there is, I mean, un until very recently, so I was, you know, involved um, with films or uh, in film-related project. And then I realized, you know, what I was telling you, you know, the discourse is happening. Um, it doesn't change so much, or at least, you know, um, you know, you're pushing it, but you know, um, the prejudice is still there. So, since last year, uh, myself and three other guys, uh, one of my, my one of one of our, our, our friends. Um, I created the the movement that we call the Opera Roma movement, right? Um, and it's a very political um, movement, actually. That um, that it's uh, that um, you know represents more politically uh, the Roma community, and um, you know, and push the boundary, boundaries. Um, even further, because you know, sometimes with the festivals, you know, you uh, you have the certain um, um, the certain freedom, or the film with the films, you, you know, you can't you can't tell everything, right? Um, but then with this movement, so we we are four of us, but then we have the uh, we are engaging uh, 150 activists around Kosovo uh, to uh, to work around the communities and to work uh, uh, with their neighbors and to actually, you know. Uh, get what it's more the insight of the uh, from the community to actually um, learn more and find out more of uh, how things you know um, can be improved and change and um, and you know just simply to be there as well for uh, for the community. <coughs> in a, in our case, for example, uh, when we started. A Biennale in Prizren. Of course, uh, it wasn't so easy. I mean, just also showing to others what is a Biennale and what is important, what we will be, I mean, what we are doing also. Uh, and then uh, we, 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 we had great partnership with schools. Even we didn't have a, so much budget on education, we were like putting ourselves all on it and bringing all schools from Prizren and beyond prison in order to see uh, exhibitions, but also to discuss with them. And for most of the children, it was for the first time visiting the exhibitions. And they had a lot of questions, even uh, what is this, for example, it's not just painting the exhibitions. So uh, for us, it was very important to create this partnership also with uh, different organizations dealing with human rights and freedoms in Kosovo in order to have this partnership and to bring people to different programs of Autostrada Biennale, for example, learning and public program, which is very important for us during the Biennale, group visits. Every day we have group visits from schools, partners, um, and uh, family days, every Sunday we have family days, mediator training program, which is very important for us. 
we, uh, for months, we are uh, training youngsters in order to prepare them, but also we are involving them directly with artists in order to, to understand the whole concept of artwork and to understand the, the work of also of artists, the venue, and also the Biennale. So uh, this is also the huge work that we are also doing, but we are very proud that we had the great youngsters that were very much, uh, <laughs> they were very much engaged to our projects and they were explaining their best way. So we, we are constantly training uh, young mediators in order to, to prepare them for the Biennale. And in Autostrada Hangar, for example, we have ongoing these skills building programs, uh, ongoing exhibitions, uh, open studio concept, which is open for artists, researchers, and activists, residences, and also ongoing public program and learning program, so through year. For us to connect to any political uh, organization would not be good because it changes so often. It's, uh, you don't know what's going to last, so we try to stay away from that. However, we, uh, there are so many other personal political issues that we, uh, we inherently incorporate into our programs, for example, equality for women and, you know, class, uh, dif then no, not having any difference in class, um, because all these things, Karachi is a city full of different ethnicities, languages, you know, religious beliefs, so we try to just treat everyone like human beings, as you said, human rights. So just try to do that and achieve our goal. So politics can go on as usual. <laughs> We're not interested in getting there. Thank you. Well, thanks for your presentations and, and everything. I, I have a question that um, started to revolve in my mind uh, from yesterday, the focus groups that we had. Uh, I was in the focus group of inclusion and communities. And well, I remember that the, the question that we have we had at the, uh, over the table was something like how to improve and ensure the inclusion of all communities in biennials. How to ensure the inclusion of all communities in biennials. I remember that the directors of biennials that were in the in the table with me, I think that was quite unconscious maybe that they started to to answer the question, but from the point of view of the adaptation of the biennial. So the dialogue of the, with the communities were important in order to adapt the biennial to the context, no? and how now the dialogue of, with the communities is inevitable in order to adapt the biennial in a place. No? Then um, the point of view you, you show now, um, talking <laughs> or <laughs> maybe the, the, the question of the debate is quite similar, but your point of view is mostly how to benefit the community in a way. No? So my question would be, you, you understand that benefiting or producing benefits for the biennial and producing benefits for the communities is part of the same process or are two different process? Or as educators or mediators, you have a double agenda then? I can answer this. So our biennial uh, agenda is to create public discourse, right? It could go either way. In the last one, it went against us, okay, as a Biennale. But we still think it's successful because people are talking about art, people are talking about its place in society when they were not doing that before. So uh, you're absolutely right. It does not reflect the success of a biennial, but it's more important that the community responds to you in any way, you know? Um, and then you adapt yourself according to that because you know it, you, that is what's very important: the discussion, the dis discourse. Maybe just want to add uh, on that one. Um, I think I think it's also yeah, it's it's very important to in include the, the the communities. But I think I think it's also at the same time very important to bring the events to the communities, right? Um, and so that it's not that um, that uh, you know we want to we want to include you, so we, you're invited and, and you, you you can you can come come if you want. But it's also you know okay we you know we, we bring it to you and uh, and and here it is and you know we can all uh, be part of it. So I think it's 
um, both are very important to, to, to play the role in, 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 inclusive, um, in an inclusive society. So it's, you know, it's not just one coming in, but it's both ways. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your presentations. Uh, I have a question for both Biennales. Uh, when you're referring uh, families, what kind of form of families are you referring to? And also I would like to know more about family days in Autostrada Biennale. If you can explain a little about uh, how, uh, what do you understand about the concept of family, what kind of families do you refer with this concept? And family, right? Yeah. Or, and about a little if you can explain about the family program in Autostrada, for example. If you can explain a little. Uh, Ronnie, can you explain? Them? Yeah, just what is family to your Biennales? What kind of, how do you see families? Yeah, what's a family? So, yeah, we, we as Autostrada Biennale, we have this uh, family days program. So we invite families without being very exact whom, with whom you will, you will come. So it's like just open families can, can come and, and see the exhibitions. So, for example, uh, it was done also a research from uh, Manifesta, and also, I don't know, I read it that uh, here families, kids were also going just to shopping malls and visiting just shopping malls and not so much going to educational activities. And this was something that also we saw. S that's why we, we did these campaigns on asking families to come and bring kids to the, to the uh, uh, exhibitions. But it's not that it was specified, like whom with whom will come from the family. Yeah, same thing. I mean, uh, dads are working during the week and uh, this is a good family activity. However, also uh, the term family in Pakistan sometimes means that it's a safe space for women and uh, you can bring your cousins, you can bring your whole neighborhood, you know? So, um, I don't know if that answers your question. I have the microphone and I will keep it. Um, thanks so much for the presentation. It was really nice to hear you all, but it was also very nice to hear the panelists in the morning. And I'm somehow stuck in the discussion of the morning, and I'm trying to find ways to go on with that. And I think the presentation of uh, Ateka Malik continued that flow in my mind. And I just want to refer to the first picture of the presentation uh, that you started. Um, that your uh, president, if I'm not wrong, was removed, prime minister, was removed uh, uh, from uh, power from outside. And uh, then you also mentioned that you try to remove your activity from a political involvement uh, so you can keep your focus. So I'm from Kosovo and I'm just going to try to draw uh, context. Um, so often, what I see nowadays and what I'm the most worried is that Kosovo is also a post-war country and um, since 2000 we kind of are in a neo-imperialist situation when it comes to relationships with the outside. Until today Kosovo is in a, some sort of apartheid state when it comes to isolation so we are part of like very concrete practices where we have to, um, how should I say, produce a story, which is a story feeding development strategies and fundings which are perceived from outside. And so what happens today is that culture and arts are an instrument of this de development strategies. So, for example, what happens with fundings that we get in arts and culture, it means that you have to fill up a certain criteria of art and culture that fits the Western mentality, which means quality you measure on numbers. 
and uh, how much and how many of us should be here. So my question is to the three panelists, but with special interest to the situation in Pakistan, how do you resist to this and how it's your activity within arts and culture not instrumentalized within this transnational politics in the role of biennials? Very interesting question. Our uh, managing trustee is a civil rights activist herself, Nilofar Farrokh. She has very specific rules about who we will take funding from and who we won't. For many years, Pakistan has been on the non-list of funding. So many people we have written to for funding have said, oh, we can't give you funding <laughs> because we are not supposed to encourage culture in Pakistan. That has made us uh, self-sufficient in a way because uh, we take most of our funding from Pakistan banks, uh, multinationals, because now um, they have come woken up to this idea of um, maybe they have to fulfill some uh, international guidelines that they have to have a sustainable and uh, whatever, uh, you know, um, organization. But uh, so most of our funding comes from local and that really puts us in a good position. We don't have to define ourselves as anything. We are just doing something for the city. We just call up people and we say, we're doing something for Karachi. Can you help us? And they're like, sure, you know? Sure, here we go. So that's our way, but it's very, very stressful <laughs> because uh, sometimes, you know, we don't have money, sometimes we do, and then we go accordingly. Um, hopefully that answers your question. That's a yes. Yes. <laughs> We have like 30 minutes, so maybe we can do a couple of questions. Yeah, I have one question. Um, hello, thank you all so much for your um, presentations. I think really interesting, all in their different shapes and forms. Um, Sami, I have a question for you, um, because you spoke a lot about the fact that uh, prejudice still persists. Uh, it's for you, Sami, yeah? Um, I'm here. Um, that it still very much persists and that lots hasn't changed or um, that not enough has changed in the last 10 years. Um, and that there's also not a lot of platforms actually for the Roma community to show their films or to be able to engage um, with these films. So I was wondering, you've been doing an amazing job in Kosovo, um, but what about the region? Have you ever thought about kind of, exp maybe you already do, in which case I'm very sorry that I didn't know that, but have you thought about also expanding um, what you've been doing with the, with the film festival across the region where there might be lots of other communities um, that are very eager uh, and hungry to engage with this? Yeah, I mean, I, w I think at, at the beginning I was mentioning that it, it was one of the, the, only the only kind of festival I in the world. And today it's one, the only one, really. Um, and in the last uh, in the last couple of years, right, there's a, there has been many festivals in the European festivals that um, were organizing, you know, special focus on on Roma people, right? And um, you know, some of them were were, were like big festivals, uh, like the Dordogne in in France, or um, or the Cottbus in Germany, or the uh, or some festivals in Ljubljana, in, in Croatia. Um, and so I was saying that, you know, it's, it's very hard access to get to these films because they are made usually totally independent um, and they're just sitting somewhere in the drawers, right? Um, and at the same time, these are like amazing movies that, uh, you know, it's a, uh, and we're talking about, you know, documentaries, animations, and, and uh, creative documentaries. Uh, and the fiction, and so yeah, I mean, there's there has been already quite quite some uh, programs taking uh, place in um, in other countries when it gets gets to Roma films, and um, as a result of of that, there was also lots of uh, small festivals that I was trying to assist and, and you know uh, show them the uh, the programs of different films, and this was all the time you know. Uh, very carefully selected and very carefully, you know, um, adapted to the country that the, the films were show. Um, and and you know, at the end, I was like, okay, well, you know, we have all these films. What do we do with these films? We, um, you know, and you know, I, 
I should make it easier for everybody to actually get access to that one, right? And, uh, and this is where um, the romacinema.org actually comes in, right? And, you know, trying to, to centralize all the, well, the best of films uh, to be available for everyone, really. So, so it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a website that, you know, that you can go and find all the, the contacts and uh, the names and the films. Some of them, or even the whole films, because it's free of rights, and some of them uh, you have to request the rights. And there are some other things that you can uh, see like, uh, and learn and stuff like that on that website. Um, so there is there is that one, and then um, and then well because I live in France, right? Um, they uh, there is always the, the ambition of you know creating a festival there, and then there is also the question like, like do I start from scratch or do I join? Um, like forces with already the existing festivals, right? Um, and there, you know, in in Lyon, I was well. I, I lived in Lyon for a couple of years, and um, and you know, there was also again some sort of cooperation around that one with the different festivals and and the film showing there as well. Yeah. Hello. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. It was really interesting to get. And in a sense, I could see a common uh, pat pattern, if I can say it. But my, my approach would be uh, when we do this kind of project for the community, in a sense, we have an ideal idea of how we want to approach things and how we want to do so. For me, is how, how important is you for the, for example, the context of the different uh, areas, different people and different background, for, for example, because I think we might have the same idea how a workshop on how a program can go, but when we go there, we see people, they don't have the basic needs to survive. So I think what, what, how important is that to keep that context in mind of what kind of spaces we enter in and how we approach in those and how sensitive we are in towards this kind of um, spaces that we enter in. Yeah, what we always do is before we do a workshop, we go to a community head or a community organization or some kind of leader in that area. We visit the space, we see, like in one area we went, there was such a big garbage problem. And uh, we asked the kids before the workshop started to take some pictures with their phone, phones and uh, just come in and tell us what they liked about their community, about what they didn't like, and uh, sure enough, if almost all the kids pointed out the garbage uh, problem. So, you know, that was the beginning of the discussion. And uh, it's, it is very important, otherwise there's no point to the workshop, you know? Yeah, um, I mean, if, you know, if, if we had a recipe, I mean, if I had a recipe to stop the world hunger, right, I would just right, do it immediately and wouldn't be talking about it, right? Um, but I mean, the, the thing is, because I'm coming from the community, right, and because um, I, I would say, uh, you know, it serves a little bit of the, um, to find an inspiration for them to actually, you know, go over the misery uh, for them. Um, I think it's, I think it's powerful enough that, you know, that they, you know, whether they, they are being part of the, some sort of uh, workshop or, you know, or, or in, you know, finding a way out uh, of the, the misery and the poverty and, uh, um, or, you know, or simply just, you know, just to um, find different ways to actually um, find their own selves, right? To, that it's not, and it's not because you live next to the power plant, so, you, you know, your dad was, work, was, was working in a power plant, your grandfather was working on the power, power plant, and you will be working on the power plant, right? But there is, you know, um, and, and usually in these kind of areas, in these kind of places, there's not much of the opportunities as well that you actually get to see, right? And, you know, for people um, from this kind of areas, you know, like 
imagining to make a film is um, it's impossible. Okay? You need a big computers, and you need big cameras, and you need so it's bullshit, right? So you you know as long as you you understand how you tell a story, right, and how you want to uh, how to want to, to to show it to the world, and you know this could be your way out, and this could be. Um, um, you know, your, your, your solution, I don't know. Um, hello, sorry. Uh, thank you so much for your presentations. Uh, I'm here. <laughs> um, well, now you have uh, successful programs, the three of you. But my question was, in your personal experience, especially initially, what was the, the biggest uh, obstacle to overcome to engage the community? Because as you said, uh, now in Karachi you have more people than that you can actually host. And I'm pretty sure also the, the film festival and also the, the Biennale in prison, uh, they have a lot of people now, but what was the, the, the difficulty in the beginning in community engagement? For us, the most difficult thing is trust because a lot of people have come in and exploited uh, people in the name of workshops or uh, progress or um, they've had bad experiences. So to establish that trust is the most, most difficult thing. And uh, as we go on, the same communities start responding and then when we tell other people, oh, we're already working here, 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 they're like, oh, okay, you know, so that is, um, in our case, the South Australia Biennale for us, as, as I was also mentioning, that uh, our approach by bringing art to people, not inviting them and not waiting that someone will come and join to our exhibition, it was a re right approach because we were going to the old houses, to bus station, for example, to uh, narrow streets, small businesses. So we were engaging people um, slowly, slowly. <laughs> And we were like taking right approach to them by also discussing with them, showing them what we are doing, involving them. Uh, and also the great mediators that we had, we, they were an owners of the houses, that they were also expressing an artwork. They were uh, also hosting other people and other guests. So uh, it wasn't so easy, but not also so hard because this approach, uh, it gives its own results. And um, so this, that I mean, because you, you need to be creative when you don't have this kind of space and find these solutions, then you, you see that uh, people respond immediately to, to, to what you are doing when you are going with the right approach. So we, from the beginning, we didn't have a problem in order to reach to the people and also to engage them in our programs. Uh, even I was mentioning in the first edition, even that we had very, very small budget, we were going by ourselves to each schools, each organizations, bringing people, bringing youngsters there. And of course now, thanks to these partnerships and also uh, now that they know about Autostrada Biennale, we had a lot of uh, visitors. As I was mentioning, uh, in last edition, we had uh, 60,000 visitors in three cities. So this made us very happy. Uh, so we are engaging them by this approach, but also by developing the uh, public program, reach public program. So um, I, I, we had also a, a lot of numbers that, uh, that shows how much we engaged also uh, different um, age groups in our programs. I don't know if there is more questions. I It's working, yeah. No, just uh, also to go back a little bit to the previous panel. So I'm just trying to also connect, let's say, the various discussions, uh, very interesting uh, yesterday and today. So what I take from it is indeed um, the importance of stories, uh, which I see as a, as a sort of uh, line throughout the discussions and the, the importance of stories from different biennials coming together. Uh, the, importance of stories from different geographies that we discussed, the importance of 
uh, having this um, situated knowledge, to go back to Donna Haraway, uh, the inspiration also for Catherine Nichols, um, to look at, uh, well, realities from different points of view, from different perspectives, how important that is. And of course, to share the story of Kosovo uh, and, the, uh, and um, perhaps going back to this Manifesto 14 Biennial, which is all about storytelling and looking at stories otherwise, which I think is a very beautiful and poetic title um, to discuss very difficult topics now that we have seen, especially in the previous pa uh, panel, and um, the poetry that I see in this biennial on uh, the storytelling and the, let's say, the more metaphorical level of uh, creating a language in which we can learn from each other's stories is, uh, is uh, very educating to me. So actually, I wanted to go back a little bit to Catherine. Uh, you have been following also all the discussions and basically your biennial and the artistic concept of storytelling and especially the untold stories, eh, the importance of uh, sharing these stories is so important. And I just wonder what you take from, let's say, the various discussions and uh, yeah, how you could respond to that. Oh. Um, I think I certainly ag agree with what you just said that I, I felt um, it is indeed that which connects us. It's um, and what I felt confirmed in everything that people were talking about is the importance um, of plurivocality, of, of there being spaces um, for all voices to come into the discussion and to be able to actually tell their s stories or to bring a story into a biennial, not just by um, contributing a work of art to a biennial, but also in the way that work of art is apprehended or that not necessarily works of art in a conventional sense are what needs to be shown or included in the biennial in the first place, um, that we can transcend those kinds of boundaries. So I found um, the, the very different geographies, as you mentioned, that we've visited and the approaches that have been taken towards bringing art to communities, bringing art thinking to communities, not just art itself, um, I felt just um, very inspired by what I've heard. I, I've known some of the models before because we've also been working closely um, with education programs here in Kosovo. So um, I've, I've been learning a lot over the past year from, from all of the people I've been working with in our team um, and across the society. So today and yesterday I felt that, um, that I learned a lot from visiting um, Ukraine this morning and Lebanon and um, Pakistan and I've also been I mean I've known a little bit about Sami's work from my research as well but I've again profited it from what you've contributed to the discussion today Roma versatiles is a great um, idea you didn't mention that actually um, we only heard it in Jordi's introduction that what the Roma versatiles is did you or did you talk about it and I just missed it it's a bit more complex on that one. <laughs> Is it? Sorry. <laughs> but I didn't talk about it, yeah. no. Yeah. No, but I, I just think I, I just... I, I can exp yeah. explain if you Could want you? to, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, would other people also like to know? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, uh, so basically I'm independent, right? Um, and then I just joined where, uh, where, what, where needs, uh, I need to join <laughs> when, when needed. So uh, the festival is being, uh, you know, um, was f first organized by Roba Wood that I founded in 2009 or 10. I don't remember anymore, 2008. Um, and so my whole work was going through the Roma Wood and stuff like that. And then when I, when I left Kosovo and, and li lived in, in France, then, um, then because it was NGO, then, you know, um, you know I, I was, not really anymore working here, right? So uh, there was nobody actually to carry on with uh, with, with, no, with Roma Wood. Um, and so I slowly kind of like faded out and um, and I didn't really work on it on, on that one. And I just continued doing uh, the independent work uh, with different organization, productions and uh, and and sort of things. And then um, and then Roma Vristas was created in 2017 uh, which by, uh, by Amni Mustafa, uh, who, uh, who founded the, um, the program. And this is where, 
uh, he actually works with the students uh, of Roma students uh, in Kosovo to uh, to you know help them with ac academic support and help them uh, applying for the universities uh, in, um, in 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 the in the Balkan region, but also abroad and stuff like that. And but you know they're also doing lots of advocacy work um, um, and things like this. But me myself, you know, I'm you know like. I bring projects to them, right, and say, okay, we, we have this project, and we should, um, we, we, and we need you, so you have to take care, part, take care of the administrative, administrative part on that one, and we, um, and we work on it. But at the same time, then you know, Avni, uh, the director of the Roma Veritas, is also director of the, of the Rolling Festival, so he's you know taking take, taking it uh, very seriously. So he. So we're working together, basically, in some ways. Yeah. Cool. I think uh, there is some more questions, but maybe uh, just to close our panel, maybe it will be interesting if you can really briefly tell us what do you imagine for the future of your organizations, or at least what kind of wishes do you have in terms of this long-term project that you have? So now at my manifesto, right? I, you know, I, I started kind of a new path to my professional life, which is the, 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 the folk tales, the fairy tales, um, and um, and this is something that was close to my heart for very, for many years. That you know, I should have uh, uh, should have started, and you know, for me, you know, I've been working a lot with. Uh, with the adults, and I was working a lot with the with the youngsters, but I never really, you know, created any content for the youngest, yeah, the, for for to the little ones, and um, and creating this, you know, collection of uh, fo uh, fairy tales for the books uh, together with together with the community, but also together with youngsters, you know, uh, to 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 make it a book, uh, and the and the play that is going to happen in twenty sixth of. Uh, uh, of October uh, next Wednesday, um, and um, so I'm looking. I'm really looking forward to you know develop that part as well. That you know um, that would, you know. So now at the moment we have a book and the collections of more more than 40, 40 stories, and you know and how you know that is going to work, right? Whether it's going to be the distribution of the Publication of the books, you know, or you know, creating a series of films and um, things like that. But at the same time, you know, I'm I'm, I'm filmmaker, and that's quite always going to be. Um, and also, you know, the festival that is very uh, important to to all of us, really. Uh, <clears throat> so, in terms of Autostrada Biennale, we are working intensively for our sh next edition, which will be held on, on 7th of July, 2023, so you all, you all are welcome, more than welcome. And in terms of our Autostrada Hangar, um, it's very new space, we just opened on March, so we are really working uh, very hard in order to support youngsters and to engage different communities in our space. So for the future steps, we are really uh, trying to establish Autostrada Hangar as a education production and exhibition space. We take a very, very serious role in, in, in our country, but also in the region and beyond. So um, for the next, years, I hope that uh, we will have uh, more youngsters, that uh, they will have a hope to live here and not to leave the country and see many possibilities this, that Kosovo can give to them. So we are trying to show them and to make them believe that this country also can contribute and also can offer them uh, thousands of possibilities if you really want to. Mm to work and to, to, to see uh, different perspectives uh, that this country can give to you. That's a good wish. And you, Atika? Yeah, I hope for a very strong uh, mental 
uh, status for our youth and to have resilience and for them to be the change they want to see. That is the only way. <laughs> cool. So thank you so much. Thank you, Jordi. Thank you, Atika, Varta, and Sami. Um, thank you all for being here. I mean, we realize there's a lot to discuss. There are many panels, many biennials that can feed into this conversation. We saw that in the focus groups. Of course, a couple of days is not enough. So I urge you all to look at our website, IBA website, to see IBA stage, IBA conversations, find out what other biennials are doing, and if you haven't participated, uh, we would love you to also participate and be part of that conversation. We're hoping to build an archive of these conversations to help each other, um, new biennials, old biennials, and uh, biennials that are um, in precarious moments, not in, uh, always in postponement, also are welcome. Um, we uh, also know that you're very busy and everybody wants to have the chance to see Manifesta because there's so much more to see. I'd like to once again extend my thanks to uh, Hedvig and Marika and everybody at Manifesta. Very hardworking team, very enthusiastic. It's been wonderful. Everyone's been so welcoming. We'll definitely come back. Uh, I'd also like to thank all the participants of the public conference. Unfortunately, some people couldn't make it, but that is life. We all know, again, with focus groups, visa situations and um, commitments. So we're very lucky that we're able to also uh, stream and have people attend virtually. I'd also like to thank the Municipality of Pristina and Ministry of Kosovo for welcoming us here and also hosting us really generously. I look forward to seeing you later at Relinja for Manifesta Nights with our dear friend and brilliant artist Jevdet Eric um, for what I'm certain will be an amazing evening. For those who are still here tomorrow, I hope you'll join those who will be going to Prizren to visit the Autostrad Biennale. I'm trying to change my flight, let's see. Um, so thank you all for coming, and I hope to see you soon at our next General Assembly, hopefully somewhere on the African continent. Thanks. Thank you, Hoor, and thank you for this wonderful collaboration um, with Manifesta. Thank you for coming, for choosing Manifesta and Pristina and Kosovo to come here with your network which means a lot to us and I hope also to all the people in Pristina and Kosovo. But of course, enjoy Manifesta, enjoy the city, and uh, thank you so much for all the wonderful discussions. It's been really educating, and um, yeah, I hope to see you again. Thank you. <laughs>